Edwards Air Force Base in California's Mojave Desert is an area where people often gather to scan the skies for UFO activity. But what about the people inside Edwards? Are they seeing UFOs too? According to this historic tape, they are. Have confirmed reports of uh, some unidentified flying objects here area. But there uh, should be approximately, there was approximately five to seven objects, uh, green, red, and white flashing lights. Uh, from Edwards. And Sightings has also obtained still photographs of an Edwards Air Force Base radar screen taken on the day of the incident. They clearly show radar returns from the unidentified objects. That's those three little dots out there, and yeah. I'll say that uh, there are three definite objects. It's not weather, it's not clutter. Uh, it was 1965, the Cuban Missile Crisis still fresh in everyone's mind. The military was on constant alert for foreign intruders, but the Air Force was not expecting the kind of intruders who pierced the Edwards Shield on the night of October 7th. There are those who believe these visitors came from beyond our world, not to invade, but to make contact. This incident happened 30 years ago. And, and back then, these planes right here, these Blackbirds were top secret. What's to say that this isn't what they saw that night up in the sky? Well, because these things don't glow. They're not made to be illuminated, to be spotted. They're made not to be seen. Independent producer Sam Sherman has created a compelling audio documentary about that eerie night titled The Edwards Air Force Base Encounter. His source material was a confusing jumble of declassified Air Force tape, which covered hours of official military communication. The tapes have finally been declassified. Why did you decide to do something with them? I thought the public should know something about it. It's a subject that has been ridiculed for many years. I was stunned to find out that a squadron of 12 UFOs was over Edwards and that there was an alert status and that five other bases were involved and NORAD was involved. It shocked me. And Sherman pointed out that one of the biggest surprises revealed in the tapes was that Air Force bases like Edwards had assigned UFO officers. They didn't have any uh, demon officers or leprechaun officers or angel officers for all the other paranormal subjects. They had UFO officers. Okay, they finally got that UFO officer at Edwards out of the and uh, he said yes, he would uh, like to have uh, a look. We're getting plenty of uh, live uh, data as a visual on these things, about 40 miles south of Edwards, several of them. The radar screen in the Edwards Tower that night was Air Force Tech Sergeant Chuck Sorrells. He's not spoken publicly about the incident for more than 30 years until now. Looking back now, what do you think? What do you think it was? You've had 30 years to sort of think about it and, and wonder. I've thought about it on, on a lot of occasions. I know it was not an aircraft. I know it was not a helicopter. I know it was not a weather balloon. I know a lot of things it was not. It was not anything that we know of as a flying object that could do the maneuvers that this did. And what it was, I do not know. Soon after Sorrell started his shift, he alerted his superiors to the mysterious objects hovering and darting about the base, objects shown on this Air Force photograph of his radar screen. The decision was made to scramble an F-106 alert bird. Uh, Edwards, do you still have any of these uh, UFOs in sight? Yes. Okay, try to pick out one you want us to intercept, and we'll take a zero one in on him. The chase was on, but the pilot faced a formidable challenge. That thing is rising. Uh, tower, how's things look now? Uh, he's low. Look, search high, search high. He does a search high. Search very high. Let's the thing is rising. Up. It's rising rapidly. We're at 40,000 feet. Still low. Search high. The F-106 pilot, when he went up there, did you think he ever had a chance of catching up? The way it rose, as fast as it went up in altitude and he passed under it at 40,000 feet, not a prayer. Not a prayer, not a chance. Was a mismatch? Oh, completely. There ain't a way, no way he could have caught that thing. After listening to the audio account of what the Air Force referred to as the incident, Washington, D.C. MUFON director Elaine Douglas is convinced that the tapes provide solid evidence of extraterrestrial craft. Elaine, we are sitting here in, in your office, surrounded by books and transcripts and videotapes of sightings. What about this particular 
audio recording impressed you so much? It's real. It's live. It's the U.S. government talking about seeing UFOs, lots of them, over a military base. Clearly, they're in airspace where uh, the only things that are supposed to be in that airspace would be U.S. military aircraft, and they're not there. And because we have the tape record of it, we know that it really happened, and it cannot be denied by the U.S. government. Some people um, involved in, in the UFO um, community believe that, that these tapes, what happened to you that night, proves that UFOs exist. I don't dispute that, uh, not in the least. Um, I think what we're going to find out now that the Cold War is over, that you're going to get more and more of these, uh, what has been classified over the years, released, and they're going to be able to reach some kind of a conclusion as to what we have seen. Because sightings like these often lead to ridicule, Sorrells is relieved to learn after so many years that there are other eyewitnesses and hours of audio tape to back up his story. I don't like to get on type thing. <laughs> There's one point on that tape um, that struck me, and it's when you said, I don't want to be the only one seeing this stuff. <laughs> yes. You know, if you're the only guy in the whole world that saw this thing, then how in the world is, is anybody going to believe you? You know, I mean, you're the crazy. But if you can get another half dozen people, it's not so bad. In fact, 700 international scientists and engineers were at Edwards that night. Many believe it was more than just a coincidence. They were there on Edwards for a conference at the time. And I've always kind of wondered, well, did, did they come there to put on a show for the scientists, or was they there trying to find out what the scientists were doing? I don't know. But it was just kind of strange that they decided to show up that night as opposed to some other night. Do you believe in UFOs, extraterrestrials? I think the possibility very strongly exists that yes, there is something beyond uh, what we know. Does it make any sense to you what it could possibly be? No, we're in much as dark light as you are. This uh, event happened in uh, October the 7th of 1965. Uh, today is uh, the year 2000, so it's 35 years ago. Uh, it was on a midnight shift. Uh, I was the air traffic controller on duty in the tower. Um, at about 1.30 or so in the morning, I noticed this real bright light to the east of my field. And it was kind of a light green, I would describe it. And it had a red light underneath it. And the red light uh, it wasn't actually a flashing light. It's kind of, I'd say, pulsating type. Uh, probably be a better description of it. Red underneath. And it had a white-like light on top uh, that just glowed. And it was very bright and it was quite large. So I observed it for quite a while because there wasn't any aircraft in the air at the time. And uh, so I called the uh, dispatcher down to base operations and the weather uh, man that was on duty that night, the forecaster, and, and that, and got them all to go outside and take a look, and yeah, what is that, you know? And and, and, and I had the uh, uh, one of the detachment guys from the uh, interceptor detachment that was on the base there, had the captain down there, I got him a break and got him to go out and look at it. And yeah, what is that, you know? And, and so we talked about it for a while, and, RAPCON people, uh, that's uh, radar people that <coughs> on the base, uh, they didn't have any aircraft in the area at the time. And so we got called it down uh, to the uh, air defense people at, at Los Angeles Air Defense Sector. And the, um, the director down there decided uh, he got to crawl around to his sites. And at one point in time, they had at least four different radar sites that were getting radar returns on these things. Um, they were getting seen at uh, a couple other towers, like George Tower, uh, it's over at Victorville, and um, I don't remember now a couple other places there that uh, were, were seeing them. So there were several people on the ground looking at these things, and about four radar sites. So this goes back and forth and back and forth for, uh, oh, I don't know, two, three hours. <coughs> and uh, they finally decided to scramble an aircraft on it to go up and take a look at it. And uh, this was coordinated with the other uh, higher headquarters, and I think NORAD was involved and everybody. <clears throat> so anyway, 
uh, we got into the um, scramble, scrambled his aircraft off, and he goes up to take a look at it, and they tried to run him uh, intercept on these targets. And uh, at the at the very beginning, I had one, uh, the big large light. At some time later, it, it was just sitting there, most mostly stationary. But it was too close to the horizon to be a star or anything like that. It was down below the mountain, the, the hills and stuff. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't a star. So I couldn't couldn't correlate for what it what it possibly could be. And then all of a sudden, there's like three more objects. And they had uh, similar characteristics as far as the lighting is concerned, but these three stayed like together. Uh, they they stayed like a, I don't know if they were formation or or what it was, but anyway, these three stayed together, and then they moved. They stayed there for a little bit, and then they moved down to the south of me and set for a, set there stationary a while. And then a little bit later on, there's three more appears, but these three are individual ones. They would fly individually around and go north, south, east, west, and uh, all kinds of things. And um, it, so at this point, I had like seven of them at one time. And so this is when they decided to do the scramble business. It was getting on way up in the, in the early morning hours by that time. And they uh, got the aircraft up, and they tried to run an intercept on him. And he was having no luck. And so I, they kept asking me in the tower where, uh, where was this object in, in relation to the airplane. And the only thing I could do was line him up with my runway where I knew what heading he was on for sure in relation to where I was. And then as soon as he got to the end of the runway, I'd tell him to, to turn to a certain heading and head straight for it. Well, about three different times that night, he was able to, he'd say, contact. And that contact means he had contact with something in his on his radar in the cockpit of the aircraft. And what it was, uh, we don't know to this day. One t point in time, he was up to forty thousand feet. And when he went near the object, uh, the object just rose real fast, real sudden, and quick and fast. And he just went under it. And there's a place on the tape where. Um, the director says, how's he looking, Tower? And I said, he's low. And he said, well, he's at 40,000 feet. And I said, I don't care, he's still low. And uh, that thing just went way high. And they searched on their radar, uh, their height finders and everything for it. And I highly suspect it was above their radars uh, at that point. So, How high would that be? Uh, probably 100,000 feet or something like that. <laughs> 80 to 100,000 feet was probably their capability back in those days. But he did have contact about three different times and he'd lose it. But these, these objects uh, played around there for the remainder of the my shift and as long as about daylight, it started getting daylight, uh, they started getting higher and higher and higher in, in, the, in the atmosphere up in the air. And by the time it was light enough that you wouldn't see the rest of the stars, they were gone too. They were just like went away, away like a like a star, and uh, they just disappeared into the into the atmosphere. I know a lot of things this was not. I know it was not a helicopter. I know it was not an airplane. I know it was not a balloon, a weather balloon or any other type of balloon. And I know it was no known aircraft uh, flying object that we know of today, or at that time. And uh, it wasn't a laser show, it wasn't anything like that. But they could move uh, real fast. Uh, they could move from the east, they could be to the east of my field, and in, in just a short period of time they could be to the west. Um, they could be, they could probably go 30, 40 miles and uh, time you could snap your fingers twice. <laughs> you know, I mean, just fast. And um, they could rise, uh, just go straight up uh, they could uh, do that it just seemed like instantaneous fast um, at some points in time when they would sit and just sit for a long long period of time and then they would move and then 
seemed like those three individual ones, the smaller three individual ones, they done a lot more m movement uh, than the other one. The, the the original one didn't move all that much. It it moved finally after a couple of hours or so. It moved a little bit from the east down to a little bit toward the south, and it moved back toward the east a little bit again, and like that. But it didn't make any sudden fast movements in, until they tried to run the intercept on it, and then it went straight up. And then there was uh, uh, the three little, the, the three that was flying around individually. Um, they would dart north to south, east to west, and they're the ones that really went fast, and and they were the ones that were actually uh, nearer to the uh, uh, surface, you know, near near to the ground. Uh, uh, I'm judging, being an air traffic controller, I I had to judge uh, altitude a lot because uh, and and like my traffic pattern altitude for a jet aircraft there was like 2,000 feet, and there was points where they were below. My, what would be my traffic pattern altitude? So there were there were times that they were below 2,000 feet. There were other times that they were a lot, a lot higher than that. And I know that they were getting some of the radar uh, cuts on them, height finder cuts, uh, anywhere from four to 10, 11,000 feet. So that's pretty low to the surface. They had to be something that would return a radar signal, and and that would have to be something. Uh, metallic but in order uh, radar is a very simple thing and it, it's a radio beam that has to hit something in return bounce off of something and come back so it had to be something it would bounce off of and it wouldn't bounce off of a rubber balloon or anything like that it would have to be something of a metallic nature that would cause it to to bounce back and uh, make a indication on your radar screen it would have to be in the thousands uh, up in that area uh, speed wise that these things could move it would have to be very uh, very fast and the radar people was having a hard time uh, determining any speed on them because they would they'd be one place and they'd set for a little while and they'd move real fast and then and the time the radar screen got around to painting them they was already at their their other location you know and so it was it was very difficult to get any kind of a speed on them but they were fast very very quick you could be watching one in the east and if you looked around for a little bit uh, your attention was diverted someplace else for just a minute you look around and he'd be over in the west and you could see you could actually see them going it wasn't like they disappeared and rematerialized or something uh, they were visible the whole the whole time but they would go very very rapidly they could make quick turns they could they just had they had all sorts of uh, maneuverability that uh, uh, we didn't uh, know anything about at the time, and uh, it was a very strange evening. So we're looking at, a, at, at at least a, a four-hour time frame that we were messing around with these things. In those days, uh, every base had what to call a UFO officer, uh, an unidentified flying object officer, and uh, we had one on Edwards, and he had to be the guy that actually uh, gave the order, uh, yeah, I'd like to take a look at this thing. In other words, the, the people at uh, the air defense sector down at LAD and the radar, which is the radar people and that, and uh, they wanted to take a look at it, but they had to more or less get his say-so before they could go ahead and do it legally. So uh, they rousted him out of the bed at the wee hours, and uh, he give him permission to, yeah, he'd like to take a look at it. So that's how economy uh, come around to getting the scramble off. At that point in time, we had a, uh, on Edwards Air Force Base, there was a rocket, what we call the rocket site. And they were messing around at, at there with a whole lot of different fuel combinations and uh, doing a lot of uh, rocket burns and stuff over there just to see what thrust they could get and doing all kind of tests and from my standpoint that looks like just about where he was sitting just about over that rocket site and I mean that's just pretty much where he was and that rocket site from the tower from where my vantage point was to the rocket site was probably 10 miles across the dry lake bed the f-106 that they did scramble that night was a cold, what they call a cold bird. It wasn't uh, armed in any way. It was just a normal aircraft. 
I've heard times uh, guys talk about they have seen things and that, but for the things I've just mentioned, they, they wouldn't necessarily come forward and, and say what they had seen because they didn't want the, the stigma attached to them that they were crazy or uh, they were seeing things or uh, they didn't want the, the ribbing that they were going to get from their buddies. And The air defense people could not admit that they didn't, couldn't defend us. So, there you are. <coughs> the uh, tape that, uh, that was used to make uh, the tape that's in existence now of uh, the incident that night was really uh, radio patches and telephone patches that was recorded at the various radar sites <coughs> that was involved in this thing. Uh, there would be another tape as well someplace that would be from the tower that I was in because uh, everything that was uh, going on in the tower is recorded and there would have been a recording of that. At the most that I, the most of the objects that I saw at any one time was seven. There was, uh, there was one large one, then there was three smaller ones with the same type characteristics, but these three kind of stayed together. And then they were, at a certain point after this, and there was three other ones that were flying around like individually. But at one point in time, I had as many as seven uh, visually at one time. If I'm hearing the tapes and everything now, uh, I hear that there might have been as many as 11 in the area somewhere that night. I can't tell you what it was. I it have no, wasn't, I can tell you a lot of things it wasn't. Uh, and it wasn't anything that we know of today uh, that could fly, have those type of characteristics, could do the maneuvers and uh, do the speeds with no sound that I heard uh, or anything like that. And at certain points in time, they were close enough to the tower that if it had been a jet or something, I would have heard the sound from it uh, because I could, you know. It, but as far as uh, being able to tell you what it was, I cannot tell you. I wish I knew. <laughs> Huh? Well, yeah, describe it for me. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, 
through the glasses, and at first the parachute looked just like a star. Yeah. And then it started, it was white, uh, white and green, it's flashing white and green. And on the appears, what appears might be the bottom, that, that first appearance it looked just like a star. Yeah. I mean, they're not, uh, it's not intermittent flashing, it's, uh, it appears to be space. I see. In other words, it, uh, the light fades in and out, rather than a definite flash. The definite flashing, uh, similar to what would, what, uh, aircraft anti-collision light would do. Oh, yeah? But, uh, it isn't, definitely isn't moving fast enough, uh, or constant enough to be an aircraft. Uh-huh. Oh, well, let's look at how many are around here. Let's see if we can dig up something. And it, it, it definitely uh, changes color from white to red, or white to green, and uh, red. Uh, the red flash is strong enough that it blocks out uh, the rest of it to the naked eye, so it appears to be white, from white to green to red. Can you get any form out of the thing, what it looks like? I haven't checked it. It's, it appears to move a lot closer to it. I haven't checked it with a glass. Uh, painting uh, over Edwards at... Uh, 11-5. Uh, Edwards is observing them from the ground. Uh, two towers observing them, and uh, we're carrying them on height and radar. Uh, uh, they're flashing white, green, and red. And we have a track on them, Kilo 157. They're heading west. Uh, they're at this time uh, approximately uh, 20 miles west of Edwards. At 11.5, there was a, uh, we talked to center, they didn't have anything on it, but heading west uh, the area at 14 grand, and he had no joy on them. Uh, center queried the bird. Uh, let's see, I'm holding them now. Uh, it was a bird that flew through the area. 50 miles west of Edwards. 50 west. Yeah. Now, uh, talk to the sergeant, uh, the UFO people at Edwards, uh, First place, I should tell you that uh, Norton UFO referred this back to Edwards as being in their area. Uh, there's a lieutenant uh, is the UFO responsible officer in bed, three miles away. The sergeant uh, doesn't uh, have any authority except just to report to us. They haven't uh, requested a scramble or anything. Uh, my question would be then, do you uh, want us to uh, shake this lieutenant out of the pad and uh, see if he wants to request? Uh, Edward said they had no capability uh, base ops thing, going up and looking. Uh, now we're painting a lot there and everybody's seeing it. So, uh, do you think we ought to shake this lieutenant out of the pad and uh, see if he wants to request uh, we go up and take a look? It might be... Well, they haven't raised him yet, eh? They haven't called him? Well, I told him to hold off until I talked to you. Uh-huh. The sergeant's yeah. reluctant to call him until he feels like he uh, needs to because it's being 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can give such a good paint and everything on him. Uh, I think it would be worthwhile if you give him a call. Yeah, that's they my feeling, too. Right. And then if he... Uh, in that area, you know. If he should request a uh, scramble... Uh, we could probably take one of the guard birds, uh, our deuces up, I think. Yeah, that should be okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sir? Yes. Uh, all I give in here is uh, special 13 for unsafe targets. Okay, let's uh, put a special 13 and a 157. Oh, 157. All guys are? Right, thank you. This is the SD. We're making Kilo 157 a special 13, uh, which is the classification for unsafe target. This is the tower at Edwards. We have an object now over the field. He is right over the field. Right over Edwards, moving southward fairly rapidly. And this thing also has, I can make out red and white, flashing light. And the captain at step one has confirmed this. He can also see this. He can also see this. In addition to Edwards, the following Air Force bases were involved with this event. March, George, Norton, and Hamilton, where the 28th Air Division was located. An element of the Air Defense Command their Major Healy gave Major Struble and Lads orders. Major Struble was called SD for Senior Director. Also heard on the tapes will be the Weapons Director, 
Lieutenant Fitz called WD or WD Technician 3 for Team 3. Captain Ballant, the UFO or UFO officer at Edwards, had real authority and no planes could be sent up from Edwards or George for the planned mission without his approval. Armed planes, Convair F-106 interceptors, set for immediate takeoff, were called alert birds. They may have carried nuclear weapons in the form of the AIR-2G Genie unguided rocket with a 1.5 kiloton nuclear warhead. NORAD was informed of the situation and did not request they be further alerted unless things turned drastic.
He's uh, checking that out with the uh, ground crew now. Okay. If he does, if they do have that down, Moses, then we could pick one. Uh huh. If uh, not, then it, uh, we'd have to have an authentication on the uh, on the scramble with uh, the weapon aboard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Major Silver, this one is to call you the SD here and and I'll let you know. And I'll tell you, I'll call you back in a minute, or in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, what, how can I reach you? Uh, just uh, call the uh, hot room again. Okay. And right. uh, they'll get you back to you in a bit. Okay, thank you. I have another call coming in now. Right. Okay, sir. Sir Romeo. Yes, Mike, go. Military procedures were in place for a possible threatening situation. We will hear that the luminous objects were not weather balloons, and alert pilot Captain Clark will indicate that the objects demonstrated peculiar behavior. A department known as Phoenix was also receiving the radar information, and this may be the highly classified agency that dealt with the UFO subject for many years. Ironically, Project Phoenix is now the name for the former NASA division previously known as SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. On the recordings, the people at LADS indicate that they had had previous experience with similar sightings when they state, we process these every now and then. That's four catcher. All right, four catchers, between WD-3. Uh, I'm getting some uh, reports for Edwards Tower, Victorville Tower, and uh, some of the radar sites about some UFOs. Are uh, you going to see any balloons out of uh, Edwards? Any balloons? Yeah. Not that I know of. I see. We'll do. Uh, does Edwards have a. <clears throat> Edwards don't, don't have a Raven sign unit to uh, send up. So I doubt if they didn't see anything. They wouldn't have no reason to. There's no reason to send balloons. Not the weather section, anyway. 
Shot off Edwards, huh? No. I see. Unidentified flying saucers? <laughs> Objects. Kill you. No, I, they have no reason to launch any weather balloons. Lad? Uh, Roger.
what's the reason? Well, his whole thing, he said, he's the senior director of here. Uh, and they don't want to turn up any of the alert flames. All the alert flames are hot, and they don't want to turn yeah. up. I guess those things turn hostile because they haven't done anything yet. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to see what's going to happen when he goes up. Yeah. Take a look at them. Is nine of them now? Twelve. Twelve. I just can't recognize it. These babies should multiply, don't they? Yeah. Roger, between WD Tech 3, 1.01, getting close. He's cranked up, but I think we hit a snag here. Uh, oh, goodness. We're checking on it right now. I'll let you know. Oh, uh, okay, right. Uh, Give me. Stem on. Okay. All, all of them appear now that the red light has stopped, and they all appear to be getting up uh, altitude rapidly. Is that right? That's right. I'll go out and watch that bright when he gets there. Okay, sir. Uh, there's uh, three more of them well south and dim. Okay. Well, well, I still see a red light occasionally out of one of them. Where are they from that big bright one? Beneath them and just a little bit south. And there's three of them almost in a straight line. Uh-huh. Almost horizontal. I see. And I still see a red light occasionally from those, but not from the big one. Yeah. Many thoughts, boy, have been observing this with me all night here. Let me, uh, let me get him back on CT if, uh, if he's getting the same impression from it I'm getting. Roger. I don't like to be the only one saying these type things. <laughs> Man, Roger. That's Sergeant Charles again. Uh, base ops confirms by uh, what I'm seeing. They are all rising. And they, there's a weatherman in base ops that has been observing these things all night with me. And uh, he's been using reference points to uh, try to judge if they were moving. Right. And uh, he confirms that they are very much higher now than they were. They are, they are definitely going up. Do you have any estimate on the altitude now? Uh, with, I'd hate to venture a guess. Uh, I would say something like uh, maybe 30, 40,000. But now this is strictly way out there type of the eyeball guess. But none of them are low altitude anymore then? No, sir, I wouldn't say. No, not nearly what they were. At, at first sighting on that one, I would, I would have judged his altitude to be no more than, at the most, 5,000 feet. These visual reports have had them anywhere from all the way up to 30 and 40 grand. Uh, they were very accurate. We got, we'd get height on the same track at uh, 6,000. These are tower guys. Oh, yeah, they, they admit it. <laughs> In fact, one guy says, I don't like to be the only guy that sees this stuff. So he went to get somebody else. Now they've got a weatherman out there looking at them. They've got the, the tower people looking at them. And uh, March Approach has them on radar. And Pedro and uh, Boron. We just heard Sergeant Chuck Sorrell say, I don't like to be the only one seeing these type things. But he kept observing them, and we will hear him help vector the F-106 interceptor, called Alpha Lima, towards the luminous objects above the Edwards runway. The F-106 was equipped with the MA-1 fire control system and SAGE computer direction center, connected to the air defense network. This achieved automatic target lock-on, but the pilot could still manually fire his weapons. Listen carefully to the voice of the interceptor pilot pursuing the object and stating contact, indicating that he had actual radar contact with something solid. Alpha Lima. Uh, Roger, this is the plane again, WDT Tech 3. This time this uh, bird is taking off. Is that a hot bird, right? No. No, he, he's cold. Yeah, he's cold and he's, uh, he's not loaded, right? No, he's not loaded. I want to up there. Okay. okay, is he uh, aware of now what he's going to be doing and everything? <laughs> How pleased is he? <laughs> oh, uh, he didn't say too much. Yeah. Okay, Edwards Tower? Yes, sir. WD. Okay, Alpha Lima 01 is now bearing about uh, 195 for 15. I have him in sight. You have him in sight? Yes. Uh, Edwards, do you still have any of these uh, UFOPs in sight? Yes. Okay, Tower, pick out one you want us to intercept, and we'll take a zero one in on him. Have him, have him uh, proceed. Uh, 
Okay. It appears to be going on north north now. Uh, having come uh, right down the runway, uh, zero 04. Stop reading zero 01. Uh, would you uh, turn your running lights on? Roger, zero 01. Uh, turn your uh, lights on. I'm sorry. Should uh, bring him straight in over the top of you. Okay, 
for the top of us again. And that's that still holding 25,000? Right, and uh, 0,000 now. Is that good? He's climbing. Climbing? Okay. He's climbing to 40,000. Uh, one of the objects is to his right and low. To his right and low. Search visually, right and low. Uh, Pedro search. Mark that spot. Check uh, five degrees either side of that certain height finder and uh, look high and low. Okay, have him come right, uh, have him line up with my runway 04. Have him go on a right turn and uh, roll out 040 and bring him right down my runway. You want to do what now? Right turn and roll out 040. Come right down my runway. Okay, you realize his turn radius up there is about uh, 20 miles. Uh, I put him to the north of him when he comes around. Right, okay. Okay, okay uh, put him down. Uh, starboard turn uh, zero 040. Zero 01 turning starboard zero 040. Right here. That should bring him in uh, quite a ways north of you. Yes, he will. We'll probably lose him when he goes over the tower. I have to catch him on the side. I've got a possible contact on search radar bearing your from your station to 075 for 10. 075 at 10. Roger, uh, anything out there? I have one at 075. I couldn't say the distance. Right. What heading is the interceptor on now? He's on a 080 heading. Okay, hold that. Roger, right, how's he lining up? Looks pretty good. Noon the subject, 12 o'clock? Should be 12 o'clock. 20 degrees, 4 and high. Zero high. Five zero. He appears... Uh, he's way low. Way low? Yes. 40,000 feet. Still low. Search high. I would say he was about unwritten now. But, uh, he should be under now. Did he pass under target at this time? Yes, he, about the time I said Mark, uh, he appeared that he was almost under. Okay, mark that spot there. Pedro? Right. Okay, search uh, 10 degrees either side. Hmm. All zero one reports is one great big bright shiny star. Yeah. That's what it appears like from the tower now. Uh, it has that appearance here now. It is much, much higher than when we first, uh, first observed it. If it's that much higher, we're not going to see it on the search radar. I suspect it's over your radar now. Was that, is that in the area of this target you're searching? Right, this is the search, the PPI. That is the PPI search area. <laughs> hey, Tower? Yes, sir. Have you got anything else in sight? No, sir. Just those two that we tried on there. Uh, and he appeared from the tower to pass way beneath it. Uh, Edwards? Yes, sir. Is there one about uh, southeast of you, about uh, three miles at this time? Southeast at three? Right. Yeah, southeast, much closer. We've got a possible contact there on something. Just a moment, I see something. I'm just over glass, though. Hey, 120. Uh, sir, I ain't a bit an optimist, but that fighter looks like he's going to a place. Uh, Pedro? Right. Right, did you find anything back in that search area I gave you? Thank you, Steve. Nothing. I don't have any contact in here. I have him, but Okay, you lost all your other visual contacts on these things? Yes. Okay, we'll cover off with zero one then. Well, it's satisfactory to you anyway. Yes, uh, I don't have another one in tonight. Uh, anyway, uh, you've lost them all, huh? Sir, I don't have one of them. Zero one says he saw some reflections off the ground that appear to be flashing. Reflections off the ground, it appears to be flashing. Right, uh, off the lake bed. Huh. I don't know what that would be in my beacon. No, he knows the beacons. 
Okay, sir, I might as well key off and break this line down then. Well, we'll see you tomorrow night. All right. I'm going to debrief Alpha Lima. Yeah, I've been listening in the air here on my uh, W-I-N-D monster. Yeah. Uh, you going to debrief him when he lands? Probably will. as they are, where this recording indicates that the pilot was heard to state contact and sounded as if he also saw the objects from the air. The debriefing of the pilot and reports from Los Angeles Air Defense Sector, NORAD, and the other Air Force bases are still classified. And what of civilians in the area around Edwards Air Force Base? What could they have possibly seen at the same time? Uh, base 
stops. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll give it he, to he'd be uh, collecting all of this data. Yeah, okay. And I think it's a real interesting thing. I think he probably would want to have it. Yeah, I'll pass it on. All right, fine. Thank you. Okay, okay uh, what's it, Roger? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, what's it, Roger? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. 